Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the We Are the Overcomers channel. Um, since I have just gone live, uh, please, as everyone gets their notification, understand that, that people will be coming in uh, slowly, I imagine. But as you come in, please understand that you are welcome. I'm so happy to be able to share with you as this is my 100th message uh, that we are presenting live today. And it's a very important message uh, and I want to cover it. I'm hoping that uh, for everyone's benefit that it's not going to be as long as most of, or many, should I say, of my others. But uh, I am thankful uh, for everyone. Thank you. Good morning from the UK, Johnson. All right, it's a pleasure to see you. As I said before, everyone, please come in. You're all welcome. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, one of the things I'm gonna talk about today, the main thing, and, and you are uh, going to catch part of this from the title, which is all seven churches are believers, but only one is raptured pre-tribulation. And I wanna go into that because there's, there's, there's been a number of things that uh, a, a number of things that are coming out uh, that Rapture Cat, hello, welcome. A number of things uh, that are coming out that are discussing, and uh, I, I guess spoiler alert, uh, how, for example, uh, the Church of Laodicea, the Laodicean Church, depending upon how you choose to say that, are unbelievers. And it's very dismissive of, uh, of, the, uh, of that particular church. And I am going to say what I believe is the case right now, and that is they are saved but they have a problem. And that is typically the case with most of the seven churches that are listed in Revelation, okay? So we're going to discuss a number of things. One, and I think it's rather important, how easy is it to be saved? That's one thing, a valid question. And many, many people, uh, are curious about that. Some actually just kind of gloss over it. It's kind of like, yeah, not such a big deal. Maybe, you know, just salvation, you know, be the, the safe thing. Um, others are, <laughs> uh, uh, are, are uh, so exclusive or on the other end, so inclusive it's either white or black. There's no in between. And so what I'm going to discuss is what salvation, first off, really means. What is it? What does it mean to say that salvation is a free gift? And second spoiler alert, salvation is a free gift. Okay. I, I want to make that perfectly plain. Notice how I didn't say the word clear, right? <laughs> if anybody has been watching me for any length of time, you know how I dislike trying to say that. Um, it is, I think, plainly obvious through the scriptures that that is exactly what it says. And, and so we're going to discuss that. We're going to discuss how hell, and yes, that horrible word, hell, you know, how does that fit into things? How does that fit into this? 
And then we're going to discuss uh, various other parts, uh, uh, discussions about professing Christians. I'm going to discuss what the church is, what that really is. We're going to discuss about being members of the church. And, uh, and then ultimately, we're going to try and conclude with once we determine um, what being saved is, who are our members of the church, what the church is, then we're going to discuss what a reward is, and we're going to discuss some of those rewards. And you are going to find, if you will stick with me, that the crowns, which are rewards uh, that are discussed, one of those uh, crowns is actually equated with the uh, longing appearing of Jesus. And, uh, and that is what is equated with the pre-tribulation rapture of the bride of Christ. And I am going to point out that the bride of Christ is a member of the body, just like all of the members of the body, and each has its own part and place in the body. But the bride of Christ is a member of the body. It's not the whole body. And I've shown that, I think, through a number of messages. It, I'm not going to cover all of those in, in detail because I've done it so often and there are so many, I encourage you, if there's any questions that you feel that I have not addressed in this particular message, because it's a specific topic, I can all but guarantee you that I have addressed it in previous messages. And you can, I, uh, please look back through my live streams, uh, and you will uh, probably find multiple messages that discuss in depth what uh, you are looking for, the answer that you're looking for, okay? So I hope you will allow me that latitude. And then ultimately, if, there, if the uh, rapture of the bride is a reward and not a gift, which I am saying so much that is in fact the case. It is a reward. And, uh, and we're going to discuss then how do you work for those rewards? Do you work for rewards? Uh, there are a number of folks that say you, you shouldn't work at anything, right? You shouldn't work after or before. And, uh, and I would caveat that by saying that if you are working for salvation, you've made a mistake. You, salvation is a free gift, as I've said before. But there are works, good works, actually, the, the scripture tells us that he, God, has prepared for us that we should walk in them after we have received that free gift of salvation. Amen? All right. Uh, Tali Lang has indicated that they have missed me. And if you uh, did not see me last week, there is a reason for that. It's because where I would normally be doing uh, a, uh, a message, as I'm doing right now, I had done... Uh, an interview online with Deep Believer. If you are not familiar with that, then please, I encourage you, a lot of people are looking at that. It's, it's, uh, it covers everything, a lot of these things that I'm discussing with you right now, in depth as well, all right? So let's, let's before we start, let's say a quick prayer and get into this, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, my Abba, 
I'm so thankful for you. You are so amazing. Jesus, you are the name above all names. I lift you up. I praise you. I thank you for your wonderful free gift of salvation. I thank you for this opportunity, Holy Spirit, to be able to allow you to work with you in delivering these messages to your people and to those who are seeking them, to those that are being drawn by you, Abba, to this message today, because the time is so very short and you are at the door. You are at the door. I, I feel it. I feel it. And so many others do as well. I'm asking that you, Holy Spirit, you're going to anoint the words of my mouth, that you are going to impart that anointing through this message and that many will be impacted. And they're going to look to you, Jesus. They're going to look to you with that longing and that love and hopeful expectation of you showing up in the clouds imminently now. And I ask that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, let's do that. Uh, all right, Donna, that's that's fine. Thank you. Everyone, let's, let's go ahead and get into this. One of the first things that I want to discuss as it relates to this is how easy is it to be saved? And what does it mean to be saved? Well, what led to this message today was actually I was watching, pardon me, uh, a message from, uh, thank you, Abba, Randy K. And uh, our dear brother, Randy K. And he was interviewing a uh, ex-Muslim who had had a near-death experience and he went to hell or was just absolutely so close to hell. And he was filled with this knowledge that he was going to be there forever. And the level of hopelessness Oh, dear Sister Paula, yes, yes, yes. I, it's, it's okay. I'm so glad you could be here. Um, and so this person then who had had uh, a vision of Jesus in his young life had had a voice call out to him and say, call out to Jesus. Well, he was a very proud Muslim. And, uh, and I encourage you, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, uh, steal, uh, steal the, the power from this message at all. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. It is very powerful indeed. But the point I'm trying to get to is that when he, as a Muslim, not a believer, called out on the name of Jesus that he had known from his childhood, he was instantly removed from that place. Now, I, I, it, it made an impression on me because having been an afterlife survivor, I, uh, I don't know how many people would like to uh, characterize that, but uh, I had an afterlife event, as many of you know. And m now my experience of dying, meeting God face to face, meeting Jesus and knowing he is God in heaven, experiencing the union, which I believe to be the marriage union, uh, that is beyond words beyond words. I had been saved only one week, one week before, seven days, seven complete days, and the enemy took my life. But Jesus, the author and finisher of all life, 
gave my life back to me and sent me back here with a mission. And I think that he, here is what happens with many that you will hear about, right? Uh, the reason why I'm pointing this out is that you can take and you can see, if you check it out, a number of NDEs, near-death experiencers, as they call them, as I said, I call mine an afterlife experience. I knew I was dead. There was no question that I was dead to me or to anybody else. If you haven't checked out my testimony, that is, I believe, this message from Jesus that he gave to me to give my testimony. I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, you really will be blessed and check it out now. Um, and, uh, and oh my goodness, and, and now would be the perfect time to do that. But there are others, there are others. And the point I'm trying to make here is that you will see a number of people who have died and they've gone to heaven as believers and uh, they have met Jesus. They know that he is God and that sort of thing. But there are also a number of them. And my point being there's no question in those instances, if you have someone who is saved, as we understand that term to be, and we're going to get into that, what then, what does that salvation mean? What does that salvation mean? So I'm here to say that salvation means that you are saved from hell, that you are given the gift of eternal life. Now, think about this for just a moment, that if you go to hell, then that's not life, right? That's eternal death. Uh, there are those people who would like to think that there is no eternal death or eternal separation from God. Um I do differ on that because I think that that is one of the points here. The, the way that you can avoid that eternal death is really quite simple. The scripture tells us that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All is pretty inclusive there. Uh, and that is a free gift. There are many others that uh, if, when you check out the NDEs that I was just discussing, there are other well-known people, uh, others that uh, Randy Kay, I, I actually did an interview with uh, Randy Kay myself, uh, uh, but one that is well-known, for example, a well-known atheist who went to hell uh, was Howard Storm. If you're not familiar with that, an incredible, an incredible NDE. There are other hellish NDEs, but there's one thing that you're going to find in common with all of them. You think, well, if they went to hell, then, you know, that's that's it. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, in all of these instances that I'm discussing, and as I said, I encourage you to check them out you're going to find that the one thing they all have in common is they called out on the name of the Lord before they were completely immersed in, lost in hell. Uh, and when, when I say that, I'll, I'll explain what I mean here in just a minute. They call out on the name of the Lord. They call out on Jesus and Jesus pulls them out of there and brings them to heaven. Why? Because he's true to his word. That's what he says he will do. Now, I, I, I was talking with uh, dear sister Paulette earlier. And uh, what's interesting about this is I was saying that all of us that we came back, we were sent back uh, 
And, uh, and the reason we were sent back, I believe in most instances, because you're gonna find that these people that I just mentioned, myself included, cannot stop talking about Jesus. Amen, amen. You can't stop talking about Jesus. And he wants us to give his message. He wants everyone to know about his infinitely deep love for you, which is inexpressible. It's just not possible to discuss the depth of that love in this human flesh. Amen, okay? But the other thing that I thought was so incredible to think about is think about all of those persons who may not have been sent back, but had been pulled out of hell as well and, uh, and allowed into heaven. So that's, think about that. That's kind of sobering uh, when you consider it. And I think that that happens a lot. Uh, just so, and so what grouping would those people be in? Would they be in the dead in Christ who rise first as part of the pre-tribulation rapture of the bride? My consensus is no, that's not the case. Why? Again, because the pre-tribulation rapture of the bride is a reward. Now let's get into this. You wanna think like, how is that possible? How is that possible? Well, I'm hoping that you're going to see it. Let's discuss it right now. First off, what we want to do is we want to discuss what salvation is. What does that really mean? Uh, as I mentioned before, we've got salvation is a free gift. Gift. G-I-F-T. Gift. Gift does not equal reward. Okay, a gift is not a reward. A reward is worked for or is attained, right? But a gift is just that. It's given freely. All you have to do is accept the gift and it belongs to you, okay? And salvation is that very thing. All right. And I'm just going to just quickly cover, I've covered this in other messages in far deeper detail, far deeper detail. But let me just give you just a couple of reference scriptures. Uh, John 3.16, which everyone is familiar with, for God so loved the world that he gave. Now, what is that? That's a gift. He gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life is that salvation, brothers and sisters, okay? All right, but let, let's not stop there because we have others. Romans um, 6, 23, for example, for the wages of sin is death, but the Free gift of God is eternal life. Now, let me stop for, for those that like, sometimes they just gloss over and it really doesn't impact. I'm hoping that you are going to stop here and really let this sink in deeply all the way down here, okay? What did we say again? Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin, so this is about sin, is death. Sin and death go together, right? But the free gift of God, there's the free gift. So the free gift of God is eternal life. That's the other end, right? Free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord, right? So what is the free gift? It's eternal life. Now, where is that eternal life at? Is it here on earth? No, it's in heaven, right? It's, it's, it's in the, uh, the kingdom. It's, 
it's not on this earth, right? There are kingdoms on this earth, but eternal life does not happen on this earth. It happens in the Father's house. The Father's house is where that takes place, right? And where is the Father? He's in heaven. Where is Jesus? He's with the Father in heaven. Why? Because he is one with the Father. He is He is God, okay? All right, what about uh, Ephesians 2.8? Many are familiar with this. Uh, For by grace ye have been saved through faith, saved, there's the saved word again, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Okay, so once again, salvation, free gift. What is salvation? Eternal life, eternal life equals the free gift. And I am, I'm I'm really wanting to drive this home. It's really important. We, and we talk about what is the gospel. Now, the, the word gospel just means good news, and that's the way we use it, okay? And, um, and so we, we are able to point out a very simple synopsis of the gospel out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, okay? And in those four verses, it discusses how if you believe in faith that Jesus, as God, died on the cross for your sin debt that you cannot pay, he was buried in the grave and he rose again from the grave, After three days, if you believe that, then guess what? You have received that free gift. Now, this belief is just not not an an intellectual uh, belief. It is a deep heart trusting conviction, okay? In other words, when you have someone that you, you know, you believe in that person, right? Why? because you trust them, that they are going to tell you things that are true. And Jesus is the truth. And he is going to tell you the truth, okay? He is the way, the truth, and the life. Salvation is a free gift. That free gift is eternal life. Now, having said that, what is not the free gift? Okay, let's quickly just discuss it. Eternal life does not mean having your best life now, as you may have heard certain mega pastors saying, a certain one in particular. Um, it does not mean that. In fact, it doesn't mean anything related with this earth at all. Um, if, If you want to live focused on the earth, you can do that. Does that affect if you have received that free gift? My answer to that question is no, but that means that you will forfeit rewards because rewards take an effort to get to. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying, that he is like running a race, right? It takes an effort. You're, you're striving to do what? To be saved? No. You're striving to get rewards. That's all. Uh, you do not have to strive to, to get rewards if you don't want to. I'm thinking, wow, are you missing out? Wow, are you missing out? He wants, he wants you to do that. He, he wants you to go that, okay? All right. Jesus plus nothing. That is salvation, right? I, I mentioned this in, in a previous message that I talked about what Jesus plus nothing Uh, how, what they said about salvation. And I'll I'll restate that again. It says, we believe that those who by faith alone and through no merit of their own 
receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, are miraculously born again of the Holy Spirit, and become, as children of God, partakers of his divine nature and of eternal life. We believe that all true believers, once saved, are eternally secure forever because of the nature and work of Christ and the very nature of the divine gift of eternal life. That it is the privilege of all who are saved to be assured of their salvation, which is eternal life, from the very moment that they accept him as Savior. That this assurance is not based on their own merit, but by the testimony of the scriptures and the witness of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't stop there. We believe that sanctification, yes, I'm going to say that word, sanctification, folks, is a setting apart unto God and that it is threefold. Positional sanctification in which the believer is viewed by God as already completed in Christ, being united with him. Progressive sanctification in which the believer retains his sin nature throughout his life needs to grow in grace, continually becoming more and more conformed to the image of the Son of God. And then ultimate sanctification at which the believer is fully sanctified in his state as he already is in his position which will only occur when the believer sees the Lord and will be like him. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm pointing this out is because, once again, I want it to be understood that salvation, the free gift of God, is eternal life. It is not a new car. It is not a new job or a career. It is not a new wife or family or uh, a husband or uh, whatever. It is none of those things. Those things can be blessings in this life, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And we are told that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here is where I've given you uh, a number of instances where that can be the case, right? Now I have a bit of a, a problem. And, and you can see this also, too, not just with the NDEs. So I encourage you to look at those. And really think about this. People that have died, gone to hell, and they were pulled out of hell before, because they called on the name of Jesus, right? And here's the interesting thing about that. They all have this hopelessness. And here's what I think. The longer that you are in hell, there comes a point where hell just envelops you. And when that happens, right, when you become a child of hell, then that's it. You are not going to change. You're not going to call out on the, the name of the Lord. And so here's the other thing. Jesus knows who belongs to him. Father knows who he has given to Jesus. Um, and he says no one can pluck them out of his hand. And that's the truth. It doesn't matter where you go in this life, what you do in this life, assuming you have believed in faith. Again, it has to be in faith, not just an intellectual belief. Because what does it say? Even the demons believe and they tremble. They know where they're going. Do, do you think they believe that Jesus is real? Oh, you betcha they do. But they're not going to heaven and they're not being redeemed, right? Right. So don't just believe that Jesus, yeah, I believe that he existed. This is not about that. It's that trusting in that he did this for you and you can trust in that gift that he, that he offers to you. And when you accept it, 
you've accepted everything that he has done as being sufficient. Amen? All right. There's enough of that. I hope that I have driven that point home because it is so important. Why? Because there are a number of people, channels and the like, that are saying that, uh, that if you are lukewarm, if you are backslidden, if you are uh, anything like that worldly, uh, and uh, that you're not saved. I disagree. I disagree wholeheartedly. Now, for example, all these people were going to hell. That's what I'm trying to, uh, to get out to you. They were going to hell for their life, right? They were going to hell for the end. They were unbelievers, right? But all it took was for them to call out on the name of the Lord to be saved. Does that mean that they're going to be part of the bride of Christ? Not likely. But are they going to be saved? Yes. Will they be saved in one of three different harvests of the righteous? Yes, they will. Okay. Now, let me see this. I want to show you a couple of things. And, and, and just to let you know where this is going, I am not doing this to disparage anyone. We all don't have to agree on every point, but there's one point, just like our brother Mike over there, Repo Man 64. And if you haven't seen Mike's last three videos, what are you waiting for? Get over there and take a look at him after you watch mine, of course. <laughs> so I'm just saying, get over there. Take a look. He has some amazing connections that he has come up with. And I just think it is just wonderful what he does. What I just love you, Brother Mike. I really, truly do. And this is one of the things that he says. And I agree. We don't have to agree on every point. But we do have to agree on certain things. One, Jesus is God. He was manifest in the flesh and, uh, and that he died and rose again so that you might have eternal life. His goal was for you to accept that free gift to pay for your sin debt so that he could have a personal, intimate, deep relationship with you individually. Not like in some big classroom, but you personally and individually. And he can do that. He can do that. All right. All right. But there are a number of those that I'm, I'm going to point this out and, and, uh, and just explain to you why I'm disagreeing. And hopefully that as we wrestle with this, and that's why I pointed out to uh uh, uh, brother Mike there at Repo Man 64 because he was he was showing the little boxing mannequin with Dr. O, O-H-E. I encourage you to check that out. It's really, really good. But here I was watching The Watchmen and uh, it's, it's really, every if you don't know The Watchmen uh, or if you do, I love The Watchmen channel. Welcome to The Watchmen channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy. It, I love it. I love it. I watch him often. But there's one thing that he was doing here that I disagree with. He was talking about the uh, Laodicean church. And this is what he was saying. Now, I've got uh, a, a picture. Uh, this, is, this is what he put up here, right? And uh, this is the point. Uh, let's see, is it focusing, folks? I hope that it is. You should be able to see it just fine. And so what he's saying, these professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. And I disagree because we're going to talk about 
the book of Revelation, where they're talking to seven churches, the seven churches, the complete church, right? The number seven, the number of divine completion. Okay. Uh, but then I, I, I was also listening and I was disheartened to hear Dr. Uh, Barry all. I love you, Dr. Barry. I love you, Dr. Barry, and many, many others do as well. And I heard him saying the same thing, that these lukewarm Christians are not saved. And I, I disagree. I love everything that Dr. Barry had. Well, most everything. There's a, We don't agree on every single point, but we agree on the important points. But this one point is what we're discussing today. And that is that if you're lukewarm, you're not saved. I disagree. And how am I going to, to cover that? Okay, well, uh, I'm going to first off start by discussing a very worldly church, okay? And uh, and that is the church at Corinth. Now, I'm going to give you first a little brief summary about the church of Corinth. And 1 Corinthians, or the first letter by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth, okay? Now, the church of uh, at Corinth was established by the Apostle Paul. And so let's read this little synopsis that I got from the Britannia Encyclopedia. And this is what it discusses, okay? Let me take a little drink. All right. Thank you, Alpha. This is what it says. The first letter of Paul to the Corinthians probably written about 53 to 54 CE at Ephesus or Ephesus, Asia Minor, deals with problems that arose in the early years after Paul's initial missionary visit in circa 50 to 51. To Corinth and his establishment there of a Christian community. The letter is valuable for its illuminations, both of Paul's thoughts and of the problems of the early church. Saddened by reports of dissension among the converts of various apostles, Paul begins his letter with a reminder that all are to be regarded as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries in chapter 4, verse 1. Then, while answering questions sent from Corinth, he addresses matters of immor uh, immorality, marriage and celibacy, the conduct of women, the propriety of eating meat offered to idols, and the worthy reception of the Eucharist um, to members of the community. Hold on quarreling about the nature and distribution of spiritual gifts. Paul replies that jealousy among those working in the spirit of God is as irrational as jealousy between the eye and the ear. Both are essential to the well-being of the body as a whole. Amen. Then, in one of the most significant of all Pauline texts, Chapter 13, the apostle explains to the fellow Christians that no gift of God, whether it be the gift of tongues, faith that moves mountains, or knowledge of mysteries, has meaning unless it is accompanied by love. He also reaffirms the reality of Christ's resurrection doubted or denied by some as the very foundation of Christian faith. Now, what I'm wanting to point out here 
is that this church, and many of you know that uh, there are those that uh, understand that there were a lot of problems in this church, okay? Uh, but it was a church nonetheless, and they were converts. They were Christians, converted Christians. Now, really what I want to do here is to, since I gave you that little synopsis here, it doesn't say that they are all unbelievers and that there's one or two believers that manage to hang on to here. No, 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 no. What it does say, and I am going to read you the uh, full uh, First Corinthians chapter 12, okay? I'm going to read that full chapter, and I'm going to read it out of the English Standard Version, and I'm going to give you hopefully, a clearer understanding of just what the church is and that these people uh, believed in faith and received and were converted to Christians, okay? All right. Now, there were some that doubted, okay? There's, there's questions there, right? Okay, but let's read this, and I think you're going to find out something else, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, again from the English Standard Version, so it's simpler to, uh, to get across. Starting with first part, dealing with spiritual gifts. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, Oh, oh, and let me say that again. When you were pagans, that's past tense there, right? That means that they are no longer pagans, right? Know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, that's, that's one thing. So, here we're going to get into the understanding of the body. So here the Apostle Paul has pointed out that every single member, which we're going to find out, member of the body, every single Christian is empowered with a different gift, right? There's all kinds of different gifts that are available gifts of the Spirit. So if you have a gift of the Spirit, you have the Spirit. Amen, right? That's what we're saying here. You can't have the Spirit if you say, uh, it, and unless you say that Jesus is Lord. So that's just one of the things that he points out there, right? But you can't have a gift of the Spirit unless you have the Spirit. Amen, in you. So he goes on, and in the line with that, he talks about one body with many members. Now, you notice I didn't say the bride. We're going to get to that. He's saying one body, and we're talking about the church at Corinth still. Remember, 
they were all pagans, not anymore. All right. For just, and this is starting at uh, verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, fingers, toes, eyes, teeth, toenails, you know, you get the whole, the whole thing. There's lots of members. And all of the members of the body, though many, are one body because everyone, even if you're a different member, you make up, you put all the pieces together, you got one body. I, I'm reminded, and I think about this, as when I was a kid, we uh, we had this game called Operation. And, uh, and, and I love that little game, you know, it was like, so you've got this picture of a body and it has all these little bones, these members that are in there and you do this operation, you've got to take these little bones out, right? Or, or little organs, it, 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 when you say it like that, it sounds kind of gross, but it's really kind of cute when you look at it. The knee bone's gonna do the thigh bone, you know, you get the whole idea. So it's designed for kids but I always remembered how you had all of these little pieces that were members in this body, right? And that you could take one out, including a rib, a rib that was made into a bride for Adam. All right, so let's go on. Let's, let's read that from that aside. I hope you get that point. For the body does not consist, oh, I'm sorry, let's go back to verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Amen. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would make it uh, any less part of the body. That would not make it any less part of the body. Yes, I'm sorry. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we should bestow the greater honor and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, verse 27 and really, really let this sink in. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Let me say that again. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members in it. Now, so who was the Apostle Paul speaking of here, he was speaking to the church in Corinth. It had a lot of problems. Morality, the, we, what if we have one guy that's, um, ha, uh, that is uh, involved, shall we say, to try to use things nicely with his uh, father's mother, 
Um, and they're all saying, well, we have grace to do anything. Well, the Apostle Paul was not too happy with that. In fact, he says, ultimately, if they won't listen to you and not do those kind of things, then turn him over to Satan. Whoa, hold on. Wait a minute. Did he stop there? No. He says, turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the body, the physical body, the flesh, this physical flesh, so that he will be saved eternally. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, so does that mean, here we go back to this whole thing. Can you then be saved, eternally go to heaven, yet suffer consequences for sin in this life? Hmm, I think the answer is yes, okay? But the more, the bigger point here is discussing about the church, okay? And with that, I want to use that as a bit of a segue into the seven churches in Revelation, okay? Now, that this goes back to what I was saying earlier about uh, the... Uh, the, the basic idea that you have churches that, that are just all unbelievers. And I'm thinking like, uh, no, here's the reason why. You have these seven churches in Revelation they belong to Jesus, right? Jesus is, you know, it, 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 he says the church is going to be built on him. So, uh, and we have uh, then, as I showed you, of course, then with the church in Corinth. Now, these seven churches are different churches, but no less churches. The church in Ephesus or Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, the church at Pergamum the church at Thyatira, the church in Sardis, the church in Philadelphia, and the church in Laodicea or Laodicea. Then they're all considered churches. And there are several things that I want you to consider. How did they become a member of the church? We just discussed that. Believe and in Jesus that his free gift, free gift of salvation, he died and rose again after the third day. Uh, and that, of course, first and foremost, Jesus is God manifested in the flesh, that he died for your sin debt, that you can't pay. You can't do it. I, I mean, what I think is just really kind of strange is that Yet people, there are some people that want to try to do it. I don't know why you would want to try because you really can't do it. Why not just accept the loving free gift from Jesus who did it for you? And just, just accept that. Accept him as Lord and Savior. Do that. You will experience a transformation, I'm hoping that you will, that you will allow yourself to be transformed. Uh, what does it say? That you uh, are renewed by the transforming of your mind. Uh, it says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, uh, and so that's something, that's something that you have to do. You have to you don't do the transforming, but you have to do the renewing. You have to pull down those strongholds. You have to pull down the imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the authority of Christ. That's you having to do it. You don't do it by yourself. You do it within the power of Holy Spirit that's within you. But you still have to do this. You don't just have to say, eh, I don't have to do anything. I'm saved. Well, you know, the fact is, 
Well, that's kind of true. You don't have to do anything. But why would you not want to? I'm just saying, here is one of the reasons why. Let me just couple of, uh, cover a couple of things in the uh, out of the churches in Revelation, and then I will call it to a close because I, we just hit one hour, and so I'm not going to keep you at length, but I just want to tell you, let me first, I'm going to go right to the heart of this matter, and I'm going to say that out of these seven churches, there is only one of those churches that uh, uh, that is uh, told that they will be kept from the hour or from the very time of the trial that's coming on the word. Let me actually uh, on the world. Let me actually read it out of His Word and. Um, this is the letter to the church of Philadelphia and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. Now, let me stop for just a second. You will find that he talks about knowing their works all through that is what they're doing for uh, the Lord after they have been saved, right? Because they didn't become a member of the body. They didn't become a member of the church until they have accepted that free gift. That's how you become a member. You don't become one until then. So then after that, he says to like the church of Ephesus, I know your works uh, to the church at Smyrna. I know your tribulation and your poverty uh, uh, to the church at Pergamum. He says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is uh, to the church of uh, Thyatira. He says, I know your works to the church at Sardis. He says, I know your works to the church at Philadelphia. I know your works. To the church at Laodicea, I know your works. He goes in and discusses in each of those instances what that is. But let's specifically talk for just a moment about the church in Philadelphia. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Whoa, okay. If they're at the synagogue of Satan, they don't belong to Jesus, right? They belong to Satan, right? Uh, and so they're the seed of Satan, and they are going to know that Jesus loves the church. He loves the church, right? Okay. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, but here in verse 10, let's read this. Because you, Philadelphia church, have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. Listen to this to try those who dwell on the earth. Okay, now, I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Crown is reward, okay? I'm gonna stop there because there's, he mentions this in more than one place. Let's see, the church in Smyrna, uh, which is in chapter two, uh, where he's saying uh, out of verse 10, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. That is a reward, okay? It, it also has an implication that you will not receive the crown of life if you are not faithful unto death, okay? 
but that's a reward that is not the salvation issue. They've received salvation. The church members are, they're a member of the church. Obviously the ones that aren't are different. And he mentions in several of these, there are some in there. What, what does he say? He talks about the church and he says that some have infiltrated into the congregation, into the assembly, into the church, and they are as ravenous wolves. Well, ravenous wolves are not church members, right? They're ravenous wolves. They're coming to destroy, eat up, tear things up, right? They don't belong to the church. And, uh, and so that's different, right? Uh, we, uh, we have another thing here uh, with the church in Sardis. Uh, there's several different things that we want to talk about. Let's see, the church of Sardis, I've pointed this out in other instances before. Uh, he knows their works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. Now, what, what, what does this mean? It means that they have something. There's something there, right? Uh, but they have to strengthen it because it's about to die. That means there's something that's barely hanging on to life, all right? But they have it nonetheless. So it says, remember then what you have received and heard. I, I just kept out, I left out that. Uh, Keep it and repent, okay? Remember what you have received and heard. Oh, wait, wake up. He says, if you will not wake up, wake up. What, what, what? Wake up. I will come like a thief and you will not know what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, let me say a couple of things about this. I've mentioned this before. There's a conditional, and he has conditionals. Jesus has conditionals all throughout his messages, and definitely throughout the seven churches. So he says, if you will not wake up, I will come upon you like a thief. What does that mean? It's conditional. If you wake up, I will not come upon you as a thief. If you don't wake up, I will come upon you as a thief. But he's also got a second part of this. If you don't wake up, you will not know what hour I will come against you. Same thing applies. If you do wake up, you will know what hour I will come against you, okay? Now, there's lots of ways uh, to look at this. I also want to continue on and point out, it says, you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. Does this mean that they're not saved? No. They all have garments. There's just some of them that haven't soiled them. Do you understand? Jesus is looking for a bride that has no spot or wrinkle. Okay. There's only some of those that have no spot or wrinkle. Okay. But they all have garments on, you see. And I've done other messages that's dealing about what these garments are, and I encourage you to go back and check them out. Uh, you, you have a, a robe of righteousness, and, uh, and then you have uh, the uh, garments, the wedding garments, okay? That's, that's what we want to talk about. All right, so uh, uh, you have the garments of righteousness, but it's, duh, I'm sorry, folks. You got a robe of righteousness, and garments of praise, right? You have, that's what it says in Isaiah, I believe. Um, 
there are two different types of garments. And we also talk about the garments, how it's related to the wedding feast. How did you get in here without wedding garments, right? We talk about that here later. Here, everything is listed as garments. So uh, the, the, the point here being, again, they have these garments. All of them have the garments. This not all of them are spotless, right? That's what I'm saying. Ah, uh, so let's go on. And then what I'm going to say is get back here into the church of uh, Philadelphia once again. And I want to cover this other part again. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Now here we are talking about two different types of people, okay? Now first off, I want to point out what is the members of the Philadelphia church. Now here's what I, I want to try to associate. I'm going to make this association. Members of the body, how about each one of these churches being symbolic of certain members of the body, right? All together, they make up the body of Christ because they are all corporately the body. But all of them are members in particular. They receive different crowns or different rewards. They are told that they are going to be used for different purposes. But they are all members of the body. And what I'm saying to you, we'll go on, but I'm saying that the Church of Philadelphia, those members that are that, if we want to consider them corporately as one member, we're going to say that that member is the rib that's formed into the bride of Christ. This is representative of the bride of Christ that will receive the pre-tribulation rapture reward. That is the crown of his appearing, right? Loving his appearing. That's what that's going to be. That is a crown. That is a reward. But are they a member of the body? Yes, but only one of these members, only one of those members is kept out. And what are they kept out of? They're not just kept from the trial. They're not just kept in place. It said they are going to be kept from the very hour, the very time of it. They are going to be taken outside of time. And that is what's going to happen with this one member. What do they do? What is the bride of Christ going to be done? It's going to be taken to, to the father's house outside of time. What is going to happen during that time? The rest of the church members, the rest of the body is going to continue to be here. Okay. For a certain time till what I believe is going to be the mid-tribulation rapture of the wheat. The barley is this Church of Philadelphia, okay? All right. There's plenty more messages. Once again, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of glossing over parts of this, but I covered it so much in depth. And again, I'm not wanting to go on too long. The Church of Laodicea. Uh, well, let me first say, because I'm wanting to point out how do I know or why do I believe that there is a, a difference? Why am I believing that the churches are all believers? And do we have something that compares them to something else? Yes. And that's where it says, let me read the verse 10 once again. Because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the you. Church of Philadelphia, you member of the body, keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world 
to try those, not the you, the those who dwell on the earth. Now, that is the first instance out of the book of Revelation where it is mentioned about earth dwellers. Amen? Okay. Earth dwellers. Now, I've done another whole message on, on about the earth dwellers very in depth, so I'm not going to cover it here in depth, but I want to make this point. The earth dwellers are the ones that are the unbelievers, okay? Now, here's what I'm going to say. The meaning of earth dwellers, I'm just going to give you this simple little snippet. Now, this was a rather long and in-depth study by Thomas Ice on the meaning of earth dwellers in Revelation. And here's the first thing that I, I just want to highlight this point. Revelation 3, verse 10, that I have mentioned several times now, is rightly known as a passage that supports the pre-trib rapture doctrine. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. As I've mentioned, the rapture of the bride of Christ is the pre-tribulation rapture. But there's more than one. There's a mid-tribulation rapture or gathering or harvest. There is a post-tribulation rapture or gathering or harvest. They each have a different place and purpose and all have members of the body. Okay? So this is what I want to say about this Revelation 3 verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Verse Chapter 3, verse 10 is the first use in Revelation of a phrase I call earth dwellers, but usually translated those who dwell upon the earth. This phrase is used 11 times in nine verses in Revelation. And I'm not going to list all of those. Because we're just going to, uh, I don't want to, I'm just going to gloss by that. A preliminary working definition is that earth dwellers is a designation for persistent unbelievers during the tribulation. Okay. And he goes into a, a very in-depth, and that's why I like it, because it's so in-depth, uh, study and explanation as to why this is the case. I believe that's the case. I've, I've also covered this as well uh, and using a lot of the same arguments that he is using. But the reason why I want to point that out here is because I think that that is one clear contrast that shows us, that points out for us that if you are not an unbeliever, then you are a believer. And that's what this church of Philadelphia is. The church members at Philadelphia are believers. All of the church are believers. The unbelievers are those that dwell on the earth when it comes to the book of Revelation, okay? I encourage you to check that out for yourselves. So if I have not made that point, the church is built on believers, converts, amen? All right, and now let's finish this with the church in Laodicea, all right? Now, to the angel of the church of Laodicea, right? The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, 
so that you may be rich and white garments, white garments, so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love. Now, what does he love? He loves the church, right? So what is Jesus saying here? Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. This is discipline. This is not judgment on unbelievers. This is discipline because a father disciplining the child who is disobedient, right? That's what's happening here. He's reproving, meaning correcting, and disciplining them because he loves them, all right? So be zealous and repent of that. Turn from that. Change your mind and get it back, right, on what you're supposed to have it on. And what are you supposed to have it on fully? That's on Jesus, right? All right. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Wow. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Now, I hope that, I really hope that I have made a strong case for the church is the whole church and every member of the church does something different. And here in Revelation, we have the seven churches, the completion of the church, yet they are all individually named. Why? Because they're different members. But only one of those members is told that they are going to be kept from the hour of trial. What happens to the rest? What happens to the rest? They are going to be here. They are what I have called, despite what many who just hate this, the left behind church. They are the Alicia's that have seen the bride go. They've seen that member that's closest to his heart, that is longing for his appearing, that is so deeply in love with Jesus, that wants so badly mm, for him to come. I know I'm one of those. Oh my goodness, I just can hardly take it anymore. I'm so deeply in love with you, Jesus. I'm so deeply in love with you, Jesus. And I know many, many others are, but there are so many more that are not. But does that not, does that mean that they don't belong to Jesus? No, you are just a different member of the body. There's only one member that is like that. And they have been picked for that purpose, right? If there are those that have other thoughts. Now, there are those that say, I've actually heard them say, I want to be left behind. I want that double portion of the spirit. I want to be doing those greater works. Well, that may be the case. Maybe that is the desire that uh, is being placed in your heart for that very purpose. Does that believe that you are not saved? No, you are saved. Does that mean that if you are walking in disobedience, that you are just, uh, you know, we all have sin, but we're all hopefully wanting to grow in sanctification as the word has told us. That might not be the case for you. Are you going to lose rewards? Likely, you're going to lose rewards. But I think that the most important thing is that if you are not in line with what happens, and I've said this before, that there are consequences. God forgives you of your sin if you repent. 
right? It, it says that, you know, re repent, be zealous and repent. It says throughout this so many times to repent, turn around, change your mind, you know, make a 180 degree, whoop, you know, get back, get back home, right? Get back to where you're supposed to be. If you don't, there are consequences to the sin that occurs. But does that mean you're not a son? No, it does not. I'll end on this. As I've said, I'm going to end several times. That's what happens as a lawyer. I just want you to understand that we always say just one more question, Your Honor. <laughs> and then after 50 questions, um, there's one more thing that I just want to be able to highlight and punctuate. In the prodigal son, the prodigal son was always a son. He never stopped being a son. But the father didn't just, you know, grab him around the collar and yank him back. The son asked to go on his own. The son spent all of his money in riotous living. We all know about that. Did the father stop him? No. Did the father send his servants to go ahead and, you know, take him by the ankles and drag him? Ah, no, he didn't do that. Did the father stop loving the son? No. But what did it take? It took the son to come to his own senses. What am I doing, right? So what happened to the son? While he was living that lifestyle, he suffered the consequences of living that lifestyle. But he decided to repent, turn around and go back home to the father. And that's what happened in this particular instance, right? It's a parable, yes, but I think it's clear what the points of that mean, or should I say plain? Um, I think we all have an understanding of what that is. You want to come back. He came to his senses and he came back. But what does it say? The father was watching afar off. And I find this very interesting. Here in this particular instance, the father is doing the watching, right? He says when he sees him afar off, he tucks up his robe in and he books out after the sun and falls on his neck. Oh. And kissed him. He loved him. He always loved him. But he wasn't going to come against his free will to go ahead and leave like he did. Was he a son? Yes, he was always a son. But he suffered as a result of the consequences for the actions that he took. But he finally came to himself. He came to his senses and realized he needed to turn around and come back. And that's what he did. That's what's happening here. He wants to discipline those whom he loves. He disciplines his children that are on disobedience because he wants them to come back. And that's what he's saying here. Brothers and sisters, I hope this has been uh, a, 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 a strong message, a clear message. The church are believers. But the pre-tribulation bride is a reward. Now, let me just quickly state, there are three parts, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, okay? In each of those instances, there is, so people say, well, what about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17? I will tell you, it is a process. It doesn't say that there's one event. We can see throughout the Bible as, as more uh, is revealed that there is a, uh, a process involved that uh, there, uh, there's a trumpet sound, 
there is a, uh, a, a voice from heaven that says, come up here. Uh, there are, are dead in Christ that rise. There are people, uh, believers that are alive that go up in that particular instance. And, but that's the process. Also at the mid-trib, that's what also happens. And just like we get out of uh, like Revelation chapter 11, when we talk about the two witnesses as an example, in those two witnesses, they had the testimony of Jesus. They were dead in Christ, just as an example, when you go ahead and read it. But what do we see? There's a voice that comes out of heaven. Uh, and uh, uh, excuse me. So we have trump trumpets involved. Why? Because there, there are trumpet judgments at that particular uh, moment. There is a breath of life that's going, and they rise up on their feet. And there's a voice from heaven that says, come up here. Then uh, what happens? Then they go up into the clouds. So what we see there is the dead in Christ rise first. And what do I say happens? Well, those that are alive and remain at that time, that's going to be what I think are the Alicia's that were left by and those that have uh, managed to uh, survive up to that particular point that have been uh, uh, brought in, new believers that have uh, been brought in at that point, they are going to be uh, uh, going up into the clouds just like the first group. And what's going to happen with the third group? Well, what do we have? Uh, in chapter 14 of Revelation, we have a verse that says, blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth. What does that mean? That means that there's more that die in Jesus at that point. Well, so what happens at the end of the tribulation? We know that there is a great trumpet that we hear. Same type of thing, right? We also know that uh, we have a gathering, a harvest of together from the four points on the earth, the living, and from all the corners of heaven, the dead. And it said, so what do we know? The dead in Christ, they're going to rise first. We also know that, uh, that there's also going to be others that go along with them because at that particular time, we also get the, uh, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. That We get that out of Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. I encourage you to see that. That's when it happens at the end of the tribulation of those days, right? And we get the same thing. So those believers, the Jewish believers, the remnant that's going to survive, that's going to be after the tribulation of those days. And that's going to happen the same way. Well, you just heard there's a loud trumpet from heaven. There's a voice. And also, I should point out, there's earthquakes in each instance. And so why, why do I say that? Because in other instances, I've discussed how resurrections are associated with earthquakes. Or maybe I should say it the other way. Earthquakes are associated with resurrections. Okay, so I encourage you to take that uh, and, and look into it deeper. Because the pre-tribulation reward is about to be given. And I... I I really feel that. I, I have been saying, and there, there are those that even say, like, Wayne, you have been saying this for the last year and a half. We know that that's the case. Have I have felt just how close this is? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Um, do I have a problem with that? No. It just gets stronger every day, the feeling. So, yeah, it's palpable, beyond palpable. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, it could happen this very instant. Um, I am going to, I, I, I'm going to leave this with you. It's just, I want to just encourage everyone, everyone. This is going to be a case where if you don't, if you're not part of the pre-tribulation harvest gathering rapture, I, I use that with slashes, you know, because I, I just want that to be the whole thing. 
I want it to be understood that that's the case. Then you are likely going to be in the second harvest rapture gathering, okay? That's, and the reason why I say that is because we've got that example out of 2 Kings, where Elijah is the uh, type and shadow of the pre-trib uh, taking into heaven of Elijah, who did not see death. And then we see that Elisha is, she, he sees this happen. He actually sees it take place. He's filled with grief, but he has picked up the mantle and he is going back across Jordan, meaning going back to that world, coming back where he's going back into, uh, uh, into Israel, presumably back that way. And he's then filled with a double portion of oil, a double portion of Holy Spirit. That's what's going to happen as I understand it. And I think is being opened up and thankfully to many more that are seeing this as being the case. How easy is it to be saved in closing? Very easy, yet very hard. It's easy to believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again. It's easy to believe that, but you need to put your faith in that because without it, you can't be saved. It says you've got to have faith in order to receive that free gift. It's received by faith. Get it down here. Faith is that complete trust, like trusting in a father that will never steer you wrong, that will never say anything. It's just, my goodness, all I want to say is put your trust in him now if you haven't. And if you just have a book knowledge of him, now granted, the book of Holy Scripture, the Bible, that's a good book. No question about it. But Jesus talked to the Pharisees. He says, you, you search those scriptures for in them you, you, uh, you say that they have the, you have the words of life. But it's got to not be just this knowledge up here. It's got to be knowledge that is in here. And I pray that that will happen to you right now. Give your heart to Jesus. Ask him into your life to be Lord and Savior of your life. If you have not done so, do it now. You will be eternally saved and grateful. Amen. Maranatha, everyone, I love you all, brothers and sisters, and I look so forward to seeing you in the air. Bye-bye now.